I want to continue on on the series I've been doing, the Seven Laws of Spiritual Success. And these came out of uh, Selwyn Hughes. Uh, some people may have heard of him, some people may not. Uh, Selwyn Hughes was a, a pastor, a minister. A, um, he wrote a number of books. Uh, he probably most people would know him from the, the daily devotional series that he used to do, Every Day with Jesus. That, uh, I know a few people in the church used to do. And he'd been a, a pastor for over 50 years. Uh, he was, he's in his 70s and he was um, diagnosed with cancer. He was dying of cancer. And he was reading his Bible one day and he came across the scripture in Psalm 71, which said, O oh God, you have taught me from my youth, and to this day I declare your wondrous works. Now also when I'm old and grey-headed, O oh God, do not forsake me, until I declare your strength to this generation, your power to everyone who is to come. And he was challenged when he read that scripture. He thought, well, okay, I'm, I'm grey-haired. I'm on my last legs. I'm dying of cancer. Um, what can I pass on to the next generation? And he sat down and he wrote the book, Seven Laws of Spiritual Success, which we've been working through. It's, it's a great book. I want to read it a bit more detail on what I've gone through. So we're up to, to law six. I'll just recap the laws that we've gone through first. First one was, first things first, worship. God needs to be our priority. We need to honour him for who he is. And many Christians are good at praising God, but not so good at worshipping God. And there's a difference between praise and, and worship. Praise is appreciating God for what he does, whereas worship is adoring him for who he is. So we need to not only be able to praise God, but worship God. And sometimes we get too busy for God, that even when we're doing godly things, that we forget to just stand back and just appreciate God for who he is. The second law that we covered was count your blessings. We need to have an attitude of gratitude. You know, in today's world, it gets drummed into us, the, the want and the, the me attitude, me, 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 you know, want, want, want. You know, you can always have bigger, better. Don't never be satisfied with what you've got. You know, if you've got, you've got a big screen TV, you can always get a bigger one, a better one. You know, you've got a nice car, well, you can always get a bigger, better car. And we get this attitude of never being satisfied. And we, we lose that attitude of gratitude. But we are so blessed and sometimes we don't see it. We, we take things for granted that we, we have. You know? we're, we're so blessed with riches in this country that we take, take it for granted. You know? Simple things such as clean running water are a blessing. And we don't appreciate it until we don't have it. You know? We've got to have an attitude of gratitude because it's always, I guarantee it, no matter how bad you, things are going in your life, there's always somebody worse off than you. You may not feel it, think, wow, I'm, I'm worse. but there's always somebody worse off. We're going to have that attitude of gratitude. Be, be thankful that we got a God that blesses us. We've got, we got the freedom, you know, even what we're doing here today, of, of coming to church. You know, a lot of people think, oh, I can't be bothered going to church. I won't go to church. A lot of countries, you can't go to church because you're under persecution. You know? There's no religious freedom. We've got to have an attitude of gratitude. The third law was keep on keeping on, persistence. And in the Western world, life can get a bit too easy and comfortable. You know, we, we get used to having quick results, you know, and, and today's world with technology, you know, it's so quick. You know, you want to talk to somebody over the other side of the world, you can email them or FaceTime them or text them or or Snapchat them, or, or whatever, and get a, an instant reply. You know, we, we want a, a meal, we can whip it into the microwave and a microblast it and it's ready in a couple of minutes. And we lose that attitude of keep on keeping on, the persistence. You know, we get drummed into us, you know, give it a try, if it's too hard, give up. You know? But sometimes we need to push through for the breakthrough. 
Sometimes we need to have that spirit of persistence, of, of running with endurance and not giving up when things get a little bit difficult, a little bit hard. We've got to keep on going until God says not to. So we need to have an attitude of keep on keeping on. The fourth law that we covered was remember to forget, forgiveness. Don't nurse your hurts. Don't curse your hurts. Don't rehearse your hurts, but reverse your hurts. Everybody has been wronged in their life. It's how you deal with that wrong that matters. I love this quote from Philip Yancey. He says, Forgiveness is another way of admitting I'm human. I make mistakes. I want to be granted that privilege, and so I grant you that privilege as well of forgiveness. So we've got to remember to forget forgiveness. And Pam touched on a little bit tonight about forgiveness. And it's not easy sometimes to forgive, but with God's power we can. Fifth law that we covered was give unto others, generosity. One of the reasons God blesses us is so we can bless others. You may be thinking, well, I haven't got much, you know, I'm hoping to get by. But it doesn't have to be material blessings. It can be something simple, such as a smile, a quick hello, uh, giving yourself to somebody to, to, um, to sit and be with and, and let them uh, be in your presence and, and maybe share a burden that they've got. You, know, you can be generous with yourself. Focus on somebody else. You know, we need to get in the habit of ask God, who can I bless today and how? And it may be the simple, you know, God will just pop a, a, a thought in your head, a, a person, a name, and, and maybe you, you, you can ring them up and just say, I was just thinking of you, how are you going? Or, or take them out for a cuppa. Or just pray for them, focus on them. Look for opportunities and even make opportunities. Give yourself to others, focus on others. So the fifth law, give unto others generosity. And the sixth law that we're going to cover today is stay close to God, repentance. When most people hear the word repent, they usually think of two things. One is salvation repentance, something you do to be saved. Repent and be saved. And I think, well, that's what I do. The other one is repentance. When we sin badly, we should repent. You, know, you do something wrong, well, you repent of it. But to understand what repentance is, we need to look at what repentance is not. Repentance is not regret. Regret is feeling sorry for yourself, deploring the consequences of your action, but not necessarily making a change. You know, you did something bad, you may, may have been mean to that person or stole something or, or lied or whatever, and you feel regret about it. And you feel sorry for yourself. But you may not change your attitude. Repentance is not remorse. Remorse is sorrow without hope at its heart. It is an emotion of disgust. It eats the heart out instead of seeking a new one. And repentance is not repatriation. It's not paying for your mistakes. It's not saying, like, oh, I did, did you wrong. Well, how much do I owe you? I'll, I'll buy myself out of it. Repentance is a decision that results in a change of mind and attitude of thinking that in turn results in a change of action direction, a turning from one thing to another. It's a complete change in attitude and the way we see things. I'll say that again. Repentance is a decision that results in a change of mind, attitude, thinking, that in turn results in a change of action, direction, a turning from one thing to another. It's a complete change in attitude and the way we see things. Charles Finney said, to one who truly repents, sin looks like a different thing from what it does to him that has not repented. Charles Colson, who was the White House aide to President Richard Nixon when Watergate blew up, and the result was that Charles Colson 
as part of that, went to jail. And why in jail? He, he found Christ. Uh, out of bad things, good things happen. And Charles Colson said, The repentance God desires from us is not just contrition over particular sins, it is also a daily attitude, a perspective. It is a process by which we see ourselves day by day as we really are, sinful, needy, dependent people. It is a process that we see God as. He is awesome, majestic, holy. And so it is radically alters our perspective that we begin to see the world through God's eyes, not our own. Repentance is the ultimate surrender of the self. So when we truly repent, it's a complete change of attitude, a complete change of mindset, it's a complete change of how we see things. You know, we, we start to see things through, through God's eyes. You know, not only you know, the, the, the sin or the attitude that we had is wrong and we need to change it, but how we view people and how we view circumstances. You know, when we start seeing through God's eyes, and we grow closer to God. So as Christians, we need to get into the habit of repenting daily. That is, examining ourselves to see if there's anything that's coming between us and God. Any sin in our life affects our relationship with God. You know? Often we'll, we'll, we'll focus on, on the big sins. You know? I, I stole or I, I, I did this. You know? But any sin in our life can affect our relationship with God. And it can be sins such as lying, stealing, but also it may be the wrong attitude, your, your wrong way of thinking. You know, have I got the wrong attitude to this situation? Have I got the wrong attitude towards this person? And we've got to ask ourselves, is there any attitude, thinking or sin that's coming between me and God? We're going to ask God about that. You know, we, we need to always say, and I, I try and get into the habit of, of every day saying, I go, God, is my attitude right towards this? Is my attitude right towards that? Have, have I got a wrong attitude? And a lot of times God will say, no, your attitude sucks. Your attitude stinks. You know, I don't like how you're looking at this person or how you're looking at this situation. And then it's up to me. I've got to make a change. I've got to repent. I've got to change my attitude and start seeing things the way God sees. But we need to be careful that we don't get consumed by the negative. Now, that we start focusing on, on the sin all the time. You know, we start seeing only the bad things in our life. And we get consumed by, oh, I'm a, I'm a terrible person. That's what the devil wants. The devil wants you to focus on the negative in your life all the time. But what we've got to see as, okay, is God, is there anything wrong in my life? Is there, is there any way I'm looking at things or is, is there any attitude that I've got that I need to deal with? And then God will say, yeah, you've got, oh, I didn't like the way you, you did this or you did that or yeah, the way you're looking at things, at this situation. And then we've got to change it, repent of it, change the way we look at things, change our attitude and then move on and focus on the positive. Don't get consumed with only focus on the negative all the time. We've got to focus on God to so focus on sin. But we need to see it as a way of improving our relationship with God, a habit of daily seeking a better relationship with God. Now, God, I want to get closer to you. Is there anything in my life that's stopping me? Is there a wrong attitude? Yes, I can't. I'm going to deal with it so I can have a stronger relationship. So often, I don't need the Holy Spirit to tell me. I know when I've got a bad attitude a lot of times. I know when I'm doing the wrong thing. I don't need God to say, your attitude sucks. I know that a lot of times. And then I've got to deal with it. You know, I don't need the Holy Spirit to tell me. But sometimes the God, Holy Spirit will step in and say, your attitude sucks and you really need to deal with it. <clears throat> but God will also use others to speak to us not only to encourage us, because we're told in Ephesians that we're, as the body of Christ, we're the ministers of one another, we're that exalt and lift each other up. But God will also use others to, 
to guide and advise us. And we need to be willing to give permission to others to speak into our life and say, okay, your attitude sucks in this area. You know, I didn't like the way you spoke to that person or, or how you reacted. And if you're married, your spouse is a good one to do that. It doesn't mean that we nitpick on each other, but we need to put permission. Now, I know God uses Elaine to speak to me. Sometimes I don't like what she says. A lot of times I don't like what she says. Okay? But then I've got an attitude problem and I've got to deal with it. But I know most times she's right in what she says. And I think, well, yeah. So we've got to be prepared to allow people to speak into our lives. Romans 12, verse 1 to 2 says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good and acceptable in the perfect will of God. You know, we've got to transform our, our attitude and our, our mind from looking at things the way the world sees things, and repent and change it so we see the way God sees things. You know, Pam shared about this angry guy. You know? Now, a lot of people's attitude would be self-inflicted. You know, he got on the booze, he's wrecked his life, he's angry, stuff you. you know, you're going to be like that, stuff you. But that's not how God sees him. God sees him as a man that needs help. And he used Pam you know, to speak into his life. You know? And who knows what the result is going to be. Yeah? But God's reached out to him through Pam. And it's obviously broken down barriers. Yeah, we've got to see, start seeing people the way God sees people. Yeah? Every person needs God in their life. And we may look at them and say, well, you're hopeless, you're a waste of time, I'm not going to be bothered. No, we've got to repent of that attitude. We've got to start seeing them the way God sees them. And somebody leads God in their life. We conf not conform to the world, but transform by the renewing of our mind. Start seeing things the way God sees. See, often when we get saved, we think that we've made it. We don't need God's help anymore. Now, I, I, I was a terrible person. I repented, I got saved, now I'm a Christian. And it's good. I don't need you to speak and just leave me be. I'll do my thing, I'll come to church. Just leave me alone, God. And we think we can do it in our own strength, in our own power. Or we mature as Christians and we, we get that streak of independence that we can do it all by ourselves. We don't need God or others tell us what to do. We're like little kids, you know. You're like, we go from a baby who needs everything done for himself then you get the ones, when they get to about one or two or three, they start getting a little bit independent. When they're a little bit older, it's, I know how to do it, don't tell me. And, and then we get to the teenager, of they know it all, uh, and they tell you how to do it. And we get like that with God, you know. We go through those stages of, you know, I don't need your help, God. I can do it, but I, I know what the Bible says, you don't need to tell me. You know, I know what the right attitude is to have. You don't need to tell me. And we get that independent streak and we try and push God out of the picture and say, God, just rack off and leave me alone. But we need to let God speak into our mind. In John 15, verse 4, Jesus said, Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, Never can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them in the fire and they burn. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. 
And by this my Father is glorified that you may bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. The Message Bible puts verse 7 as this. If you make yourself at home with me and my words at home in you, you can be sure that whatever you ask will be listened to and acted upon. We need God in our life. We can't say, oh, okay, I've got that independent streak, I don't need you, God. You know? If we're not connected to God, we're going to wither and die away. So often, Jesus has moved in, but as a guest only. We're not at home with him. Instead, we're abiding with someone else or something else. Sometimes we get caught up doing all the right things, good works, not sinning, etc., but we're abiding in ourselves. We're doing it for ourselves to make us feel better or look better. And we're putting our trust in good works instead of God. It doesn't mean you don't do good works. just need to make sure that we're abiding in him when we do them. That way we make sure that we do it with the right attitude. We need to be connected to God. We need to uh, have, you know, part of the reason a, a branch is connected to the vine is that it gets its life source from that. And if you cut the branch off, as the scripture said, it will die because it's disconnected from the life source. We need to be connected to God, our life source. In, in Revelation, the book of Revelation, Christ is talking to the church of Ephesus. And he's, and the church of Ephesus was, was a strong church, or a dynamic church. When This was a church that was planted by the Apostle Paul. Planted by, and it was a dynamic church. But then it took its focus off God and started to focus on other things. And its relationship with God was no longer strong. And Christ, when talking to the church, said three things. He said, remember where you have fallen from, the love of God and of people. You need to repent and you need to return. So they, they'd grown so strong that they started thinking that they didn't need God anymore in their life. They took their focus of God and they started, they lost the love of God and they lost the love of the people. And they started seeing people as problems instead of loving them. And Christ said you need to repent. You need to change your attitude. You need to change your focus. And you need to return and focus on God. We need to stay plugged into God, our source of life and power. In the natural, the closer to the power source, the stronger the power. You know, if you, you get closer to the sun, you get a bit more warmth. The same with electricity. You know, the closer you are to the power source, you get good electricity. You can't have an extension lead 200 metres long for a simple reason. You have 240 volts coming out of the power point, but you won't have 240 volts at the end of the extension lead because it fades as it goes along because it reaches resistance. We need to be constantly plugged in to God and we need to be close to God. The closer to God we are, the stronger the life source that we get. Charles Colson said, The ultimate ongoing surrender of self through daily submission to God is the key that allows the real self, the real person, to emerge. <coughs> now, if we want to be the best Christian that we can be, then we've got to be close to God. The closer to God, the better Christian that we will be, the better person that we'll be. When we start to see things the way God sees things, if we start having the same attitude that God has to things, then we'll be a better person. God wants us to be all that we can be and to achieve what we need to be. We need to be close to God. So the sixth law of spiritual success is stay close to God, repentance. Amen. 
Any comment? Feedback? Nadia. True. That's not easy. As, as the famous Prime Minister said, life wasn't meant to be easy. And that's the And I always found when you make your mind up to do something, like you know, I'm going to have a good attitude, I'm going to love people, I guarantee some nut nut from a nasty person is going to come into your life and challenge you on that. And it's hard. Uh, and when somebody wrongs you, particularly when they wrong your kids, uh, the normal reaction of the world is, well, let's get revenge. You hurt me, I'll hurt you. And I've been there, done that. Uh, and what I've found is it doesn't work because it flows into tit for tat. It may feel good for the time being, but it never achieves anything. And what we're going to do is say, hey, God, and, and God knows, you know, he's, he's all knowing. He knows your attitude. He knows how difficult it is for you. And, and what we're going to say is that God is, okay, I'm really struggling with this person. This person is really, really annoying me. Okay? Help me, God, to have the right attitude towards them. And, and even pray for them. Okay? And there's spiritual battles going on. That we're not aware of, and and then I and I've shared it before. I've shared one time about the guy at work that I had a few years ago, that I never met the guy before, and he took an instant dislike to me. Uh, he was a unit controller, so he had a bit of power. And uh, sorry, Phil, a lot of unit controllers on a power kick <laughs> because they got the power, they're on the good money, and that. But I was chief electrician, you know which meant he needed me more than I needed him. Because when he had a fault with his plant, who did he have to ring? He had to ring me and ask me to come fix his plant. And when he turned nasty to me, I thought, okay, I'll be nasty to you too. So I was. And it went tit for tat, fit, tit for tat, and it just escalated. And the guy, other unit jobs, well, oh, what was going on here, you eh? And then God spoke to me one day. He said, your attitude sucks towards this guy. I said, well, you know, I did the usual little kid thing. Well, he started it, you know, and I, I didn't do anything wrong. And God said to him, no, your attitude sucks. You need to deal with it. You need to be nice to him. So I made up my mind, and I prayed for him that night. The very next day, I, got in the lift, the, I was waiting in the lift. The lift door opened, and he was in the lift. And I thought, great. So I get in the lift and we're saying, and straight away he started talking to me. And there was, I was broken, you know. I didn't apologise to him, he didn't apologise, it was just broken. Because I, I had an attitude change, but it's not easy. And sometimes it won't happen that quick. And you know, sometimes you'll pray and it will get worse. Yeah. You know? And you'll keep praying. But that's where persistence comes in as well. Say, so, okay, God, I okay, go. I'm going to keep loving them. It doesn't mean you don't, have to get, you don't have to go out of your way and hug them and kiss them and say, oh, you're a great person, sort of thing. But just try and be civil to them. And even if they're not civil back to you, you just got to keep doing that and say, God, help me. Oh, and even sometimes when you're in the room with them and you're getting the anger bubbling up, you say, God, help me. Help me. Yeah? And it's just a quick prayer in your mind over them. I, I won't guarantee that you get breakthroughs straight away. And, and sometimes it will take yonks. Sometimes you might not ever see it. But that, the aim of the game is we've got to have the right attitude. Yeah? And I've had people say to me, you know, if Adolf Hitler had repented and asked Christ in his heart, would he have got to heaven? The answer is yes. You know? 
to a worldly view, was no, the guy's a scumbag and she deserves to go to hell. But the simple fact is, if he repents, accepts Jesus in his heart, all our sins are forgiven. If God sees sin as sin, he doesn't rank it. You know, he doesn't say, well, you're a worse person than this person. So, so it's, it's, it's what answer is, it's not easy to do. But we've just got to ask God to help us.